This is a production of PBS Charlotte. Just ahead on Carolina Impact. We're on the Catawba River to find out more about this year's big spill and all the other spills. And to answer the question, is the lake water safe to swim in or not? I'm Jeff Sonier. Stick around, we'll have more. And she used to oversee cybersecurity at the White House. Now, she's a national expert based right here in Charlotte. We'll introduce you to Teresa Payton. Plus, as a kid, I loved riding my bike all over the neighborhood in the summertime. We'll learn about a local nonprofit helping kids get their own set of wheels. Carolina Impact starts right now. Carolina Impact, covering the issues, people, and places that impact you. This is Carolina Impact. Good evening, thanks so much for joining us. I'm Amy Burkett. A day at the lake sounds like fun. Your kids buckled in, your kayak or paddle board strapped to the roof, and off to your favorite watering hole. But how do you know where the water's safe and where it's not? Our need to know became very clear last April when 15 million gallons of sewage spilled into the Catawba River, the biggest in North Carolina history. And of course, that impacts downriver into South Carolina as well. PBS Charlotte has learned that the Catawba Riverkeeper is proposing new rules that would require reporting all sewage spills, chemical leaks, and other problems on lakes and rivers to a single clean water website. In this week's Planet Carolina report, we tell you about a proposal called SHARK, the Sewage Health Advisory Right to Know Act. Reporter Jeff Saunier has new details. Jeff? Yeah, Amy, we're out here on the lake and the river with the Catawba River Keeper to find out more about that big spill that everybody heard about in the news earlier this year and all the other spills and problems that you don't hear about. Just like those summer shark movies, river keeper Sam Perkins says what he worries about most on our lakes, what we should all be afraid of really, is the unknown. What is this pipe? They said, we don't know. It's just getting Like this buried. forgotten old drain pipe from a toxic coal ash pond they found seeping outside the power plant in Belmont. So you can tell there's been erosion happening here. It's not like they just cleared this today. Or the runoff from this unreported, unprotected construction site. This is atrocious, this is a joke. Not to mention a perfect place for bacteria to breed. You know, bacteria is bacteria when it's the type that can make you sick, so. You need to know whether or not the water is safe to swim in. Far and away, the most common question we get is, is the water safe to swim in? Yeah, we come here boating. We're, all, we're on the beach in the water almost every weekend. Jantel Suter keeps a close eye on the kids here at Windjammer Park on Lake Wiley. That's her two-year-old with the surfboard, her five-year-old with the sand pail, and her seven-year-old with the missing front tooth. You ever seen a problem with the water? No, not at all. Um, we, like I said, we come here all the time, and the water is always, I mean, it seems to be clean. Get these spills in the river, and I do have a little bit of concern about that. Steve Kerrigan's here at Windjammer, too, with his wife and their grandkids. I mean, you know, I don't want to get in the water if it's toxic. This is Long Creek. It was upstream here where the spill occurred. It was a sewer line back in April that caused the biggest spill in North Carolina history. More than a million gallons of sewage a day in Long Creek, 15 million gallons total. And of course you have, with the Whitewater Center immediately downstream, a lot of people recreating and having skin contact with the river. The river keeper takes us past all these paddle boarders and kayakers at the Whitewater Center to show us the where and the why. What happened with the 15 million gallon spill was that you had a lot of rain caused a tree to fall over and that caused the sewer line to break. The broken 30 inch sewer line emptied for seven days into this muddy water until it was found on April 23rd, seeping sewage for three more days before it was fixed on April 26th. There were also high bacteria levels and a no swim advisory until May 2nd which all sounds pretty bad. But here's the part you haven't heard about, the part that makes the big spill even worse. This is video from the Whitewater Center's annual Tuck Fest event. 
attracting more than 30,000 visitors. And this year, it was the same long weekend in April when the million gallon a day sewage leak in Long Creek was still undiscovered. With events for swimmers, kayakers, and paddleboarders in the water just 600 yards away from a creek they didn't know was contaminated. Everyone deserves to know when that water is not safe for contact. Mecklenburg County says they do test for bacteria at the Whitewater Center's kayaking and paddleboarding area every month, but only from May to September, starting a month after this year's big spill. There aren't buoys put out. There's typically one sign that notes it, and you really don't know how far out that extends. At Windjammer Park in Tika K, they test their water every week during the swimming season. And here at the YMCA's Camp Thunderbird on Lake Wiley, there's actually a Mecklenburg County water testing station right on their ski tower, where those swimmers are sitting. In other words, reporting and monitoring on the Catawba is a multi-state, multi-county mishmash that shows just how vulnerable the lakes and the people who use the lakes really are. There's not a single central place that you can go to find out when and where did a spill occur, and we want to change that in both state legislatures this upcoming session. And it would be so simple to do a map where you can show where a spill occurred, where there's bacteria monitoring and a no swim advisory. Really, the success story I want to highlight is River Bend. At their annual meeting, the Riverkeeper Foundation is also pushing for removal of old lakeside power plants, where coal ash is a chemical pollution problem. Two stacks down, four stacks down, half the powerhouse down, it's gone. You mentioned the, the number one question, the number one issue that people bring to you is, is the water safe to swim in? What do you tell them? It depends. The sediment settles out, the sunlight really is able to penetrate, and I'm telling you, from the sky, this water can look like the Caribbean after a while. It really can. Like it does on this day in Tiga K. We love the lake, we love the water. It's when it's hard, keeping the kids away. And I'm guessing you can't keep them out of the water. No, not at all. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're water people. Jeff Sonier joins us in the studio now. Jeff, talk to us a little bit about that shark proposal. Well, uh, what they're proposing, the Riverkeeper uh, Foundation is proposing, is that both states work together to provide more information for the public. That's really a part of the problem, not just the spills themselves, but not knowing where those spills are. And uh, there's so much technology out there today that would allow us to simply go to a website, to look at a map, to know this particular spot is safe to swim in, this particular spot isn't safe to swim in. It's the same kind of system they have down at the beach right now in both North and South Carolina, but they don't have it in any of the inland rivers or lakes and Riverkeeper's trying to change that statewide. In the story you talked about swimming and boating, but let's talk about drinking water. Should we be concerned? Actually, that's one place where there's a lot of coordination from county to county, from municipality to municipality. When there's a spill, they talk to each other. They know that there's something in the water that they need to be aware of. They, they up their game, if you will, to make sure that it doesn't affect the drinking water. And um, in this particular case, the big spill back in April, uh, all, the, all the downstream systems that knew that this pollution was coming towards them, they were ready for it. There was never any suggestion that there was a problem with the drinking water, even though that toxic water, that, uh, that polluted water was being filtered through these drinking water systems. Um, Usually the technology is pretty good and the coordination between systems uh, worked like a charm this particular. As our region continues to grow at, at an incredible pace, is there any concern about having enough drinking water? You know, that's a question I asked Sam Perkins, the river keeper. He says, obviously, the more growth there is in Charlotte, the more pressure it puts on the water supply, like Norman Lake, Wiley, Mountain Island Lake. But he says, as Charlotte has grown, they have also improved and upgraded their sewage treatment systems. And he said, in many ways, despite the growth, the systems are so much better today. They've been improved so much and expanded so, so well that they do a better job today with the growth, treating that sewage than they used to do when there were fewer people, but they had less technologically advanced systems. So like he says, in many ways, um, the growth that causes the problems also causes the city of Charlotte and other municipalities to uh, improve their facilities and make sewage less of a problem going forward. 
We learn so much, Jeff. We always appreciate your reports. Thanks, Amy. If you have a story idea for our ongoing Planet Carolina series on the environment, you can email us at stories at WTVI.org. Well, it's perhaps the greatest threat to every company worldwide and consumers. In 2015, cybercrime cost $3 trillion. That number is expected to double in three years. What can be done to stop or slow down these hackers? Carolina Impact's Jason Terzas caught up with someone who's on the leading edge of crime fighting in cyberspace. And she lives right here in the Queen City. This week, an 11-year-old boy reportedly hacked into an imitation of a Florida State voting website. Cybersecurity breaches, they're everywhere these days. Now, with that massive security breach possibly putting 143 million Americans at risk. Another week brings another headline-making attack. Well, do hackers have your financial information from Equifax? You know, like your credit card info, mortgage data, social security number, and basically everything they need to clean you out. In just the last few years, major companies Equifax, Home Depot, Anthem Health, eBay, Target, Sony Pictures, and many others have faced major privacy breaches by hackers. So I looked for a company, couldn't find one, so I built my own. Yesterday's espionage stories are now today's cybersecurity stories, and things that there were once in spy movies are now actually being done against companies daily. With it happening so often to so many companies and individuals, people are wondering what can be done to stop it, or at least slow it down. It's a new battlefield, even in the corporate world. The alarm clock goes off early at Teresa Payton's home in Dilworth, usually before the sun comes up. Teresa soon emerges for her morning run. It's a chance to clear her head and think about the day that's about to unfold. <laughs> Teresa is on the leading edge of fighting cyber crime. Protecting people and fending off the bad guys is in her blood. I'm the daughter and a granddaughter of the Marine Corps. I went to nine schools between kindergarten and 12th grade. I married a Naval Academy grad and he was the son of the Navy. Teresa began her career in the financial sector, including senior vice president roles at Bank of America and Wachovia. She was on the cutting edge of technology. Then one day, her assistant took a call. She said, Miss Teresa, you had a call from the White House. And I said, the apple juice company or the clothing company? And she said, no, the one in Washington, D.C. And I said, am I in trouble? No, she wasn't in trouble. Turns out the White House was calling about a job. Teresa became the first woman to serve as White House Chief Information Officer, overseeing IT security operations for President George W. Bush and the executive branch. Just an incredible honor. She held the position from 2006 through 2008, creating the White House's first 24-hour cybersecurity center. A typical day, not always, but almost always, um, left around 10 o'clock at night, some nights lots later. Once President Bush left office, it was time for Teresa to move on. She wanted to continue working in cybersecurity, but where? I thought to myself, I need to go find a company who's thinking about this the way I'm thinking about this now. She created Fortalist Solutions in Charlotte, a team of cyber crime fighters designing, developing, and deploying customizable services and strategies to fend off the bad guys. We look at human risk and we look at network risk, we meld them together, we come up with a cybersecurity program, a roadmap a company can follow, and then we help them implement that roadmap. It's almost like we're trying to help them build their house, uh, and, and then as they build it, we try to break into it and see you know, are there still any, any windows that need to be locked, any doors that need to be shut and locked, and then advise them on how to best secure their house. In just over 10 years, Fortalis has risen from startup to being ranked 250th on the Cybersecurity 500 Global Rankings, with Teresa number four on the list of top 50 global cybersecurity influencers. I can't be more proud of my team. It's no wonder Teresa is often sought out by media outlets to lend her insight from local television newscasts. Joining us live via Skype is our cybersecurity expert, Teresa Payton. Teresa, always good to see you. To 24-hour cable well, news networks. Here and tell me, who knows more about me these days? Uh, is it the government or is it Target? It's probably Target and all the other retailers. Wow. Um, and daytime talk shows. These are the tips that you have. First, you say cover cameras and remove recording devices from private areas. What do you mean by that? The rule I like everybody to remember is the CC rule, cover cameras. Assume every device, your laptops, computers, tablets, your smartphones, they're all recording devices if they can talk to the internet, even if it looks like it's off. Teresa is also an author, writing multiple books on cybersecurity. She was even a guest on Comedy Central's Daily Show with Jon Stewart, and she's also a renowned speaker. You'll be amazed with a British accent or a Southern accent how you can sweet talk people out of their user IDs and passwords. 
And at home, she's a wife and a mother to three children and two rescue dogs. Oh, and did we mention she's also an actress? Yeah, that's right. Teresa played herself on the CBS show Hunted. At command center, Teresa's intel team dives deep into background research on Matt and Christina. Matt is six foot eight, which is freakishly tall. If you saw a six foot eight person just walking around, you'd say, hey, look at that guy. With a gorgeous 5'11 blonde That's on his right. arm? Yeah. Yeah. They're not going to blend. All this brings up the question, what doesn't this woman do? We're all not quite sure. I, I think it's because Teresa doesn't sleep. I don't know how one person can do all that, but it's really impressive. I came up with a system, and I've color-coded um, my calendar towards the system. Um, and it's my five Fs. So it's faith, family, friends, fellowship, which is like your community service, and then the last thing is, what are you fighting for? For me, I'm fighting for everybody's security and safety. She may not carry a badge or wear a police uniform, but Teresa Payton is on the front lines of fighting crime in a world that can use all the help it can get. For Carolina Impact, I'm Jason Churches reporting. Thanks so much, Jason. Teresa's company donates time and resources to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. I met her while speaking at a national conference just about a year ago, and I couldn't wait to share her story with you. She's an amazing woman, with a heart of pure gold. Well, for many people, their car is their trophy. Can you believe that there are still 90-year-old cars on the road today? If you own a Model A, that's certainly something to be proud of. Producer John Branscombe spent some time with Model A vintage car buffs, taking great care of these vintage wheels. Check it out. My name's Ed Longino. We're in a 1930 Ford Model A two-door. These things are geared real low, so you get going in first, just barely moving, and then you shift into second at about six miles an hour. My wife and I just fell in love with Model A's when we were around them for, for a week. And we said, you know, we got a 1930 boat. Um, it'd be cool to have a 1930 car. Being around these other guys, you know, the camaraderie side of it is, is special. Um, and learning about the history of Model A's is uh, very interesting and about uh, Henry Ford. We're a Queen City Model A Club. It's a shop time event. There were people in the club, young people in the club, didn't know how to maintain their cars. And I am Jim Townsend. I am a member and I'm, this year I'm also a co-president. Take a look, look at it. We've got the lift and we've got plenty of room to bring cars in. We've got good work benches to work on. You pull that plug out right there. It's, it's like a tutorial. Every one of us has something to contribute. My name is Danny Phillips. Uh, for those guys that have done this before, they're helpful. They can tell you what you need to look for and what to expect. Dave said, my heart, car was hard was to catch on that trip. I said, you know, mine was too. And then Danny comes up and says, my car was hard. It was hot, the oil was thin. For those of us who've never done it before, it gives us an opportunity to get our hands on it. It's a 1929 Ford Phaeton. Uh, this car is it's a four-door convertible. Let, you, let the tape come down on the bumper. Front end has a shimmy in now, it. Now that, that tip will slip, you know. And we're trying to take the shimmy out. If you go across a railroad track or hit a little pothole in the road, the front wheels would start to wobble. And so we've taken his whole front end apart. It's fairly easy to work on. It's not complicated. We're not having to replace any parts yet. We adjusted the toe end. We greased his wheel bearings and tightened them a little bit. He had a little bit of play in his wheel bearings. But everything else checked out real good. The car's in good shape and safe to drive. It's a social event. There's a lot of watching going on, but then there's side discussions on the side, and there's no wear on that if you don't have any end play. Anything we do brings a question, well, you know, my car does such and such, what do you think about that? And so we share stories and share, share information that way. It's fun to work on the old cars, but it's more fun to share with other people what you're doing. And it's fun. I mean, go beyond the importance of it, of sharing knowledge on how to work on them. Uh, we like to drive them. I love the sound of them. If you've ever heard the exhaust sound of a Model A, it's different from anything else. They're just a lot of fun to drive. It, it's, it's like anything else. There's some things you do, you enjoy doing by yourself, and you don't want to have anybody else. This is not one of them. It's a good way to spend some time together. Thanks so much, John. This story is near and dear to his heart because he inherited a Model A from his dad. 
The Queen City Model A Club organizes several trips a year, putting hundreds of miles on those classic cars. Well, speaking of travel, the signs are everywhere. Charlotte's becoming a more bike-friendly city. Uptown, they're easy to rent for an hour or a day. Trails are being built and bike lanes are being added. But for some of our youngest citizens, no bike means no bike rides. Sometimes the obstacle is money. Often it's access and opportunity. Tonight, our Sharon Smith shows us how a special team helps kids earn their own wheels. I want to ride my bicycle. I want to ride my bike. As these kids ride into the wind on a warm day, they're also learning to tackle trails, cruise over bridges, sidewalks, and streets with confidence. The ultimate joy ride. I feel good. I get to ride it with other people. Trips for Kids Charlotte put it all in motion. The nonprofit teaches young people bike safety and empowerment through cycling. It's about giving families and children access to bicycles so they can now go, you know, all over the city and actually see things that they otherwise would not be able to do because they might have not had transportation. Program director Anna Glodowski says Trips for Kids works with 1,100 children each year through riding activities and their Earn a Bike program, which targets underserved kids from ages 9 to 15. Thanks for calling Recycery. This is Paul. Money from sales at their used bike shop in Uptown helps keep programs like Earn a Bike going and growing. The Recyclery has thousands of used bikes waiting for new owners and a team of bike mechanics who makes them ride and shine like new. It's always busy, with a range of clientele from bike enthusiasts to people who have no other means for transportation. I see the, the change that, um, you know, having self-sufficient self mobility can do for a person, uh, both health-wise and, like, for their work, their livelihood, and just their happiness. Shop manager Eric Supel once found himself in the same position as a lot of customers. That's why he believes in reclaiming bikes for low cost quality mobility. Usually this bike is about $1,500. Um, so once this is fully refurbished uh, with us, we'll probably sell this for about $400. High end, low end, and literally all the parts in between have a price tag. The more they sell, the more they have to help kids earn other bikes for free. It's just a matter of running through the gears. Seems to work quite well. The priority now is finishing up for Erna Bike's newest graduating class. Remember when you got your first bike? That was a really good day. So to the extent that we can facilitate that happiness. They do. Retiree turned bike tech Paul Gussler never passes up a possibility. On your typical trash day, you know, walking through my neighborhood, I you know, typically see bikes like this. The child who originally this bike was purchased for has run through it. As kids do, they've broken enough things to where dad can't fix it. So it's time to move on. They go buy another bike, and this one you know, gets cast off to the landfill. Gussler says all it takes is a couple of hours and a few parts to make these bikes safe and functional. According to this lifelong cyclist, the payoff is big. Cycling is all about freedom. It's the ability to get away from your parents, to go see your friends, you know, to experience a lot of new things. Kids in neighborhoods on bicycles, that is what defines a kid to me. More kids are about to get that chance with their own bikes, complete with helmet, locks and lights all done and ready to be loaded up for the graduation. Go ahead and check out your bike. Make sure everything's adjusted. On this day, 12-year-old Jemiah and her younger brother, Jermaine, finally get to ride the bikes they picked out weeks ago when classes started. Now it's time to put them to the test. Previous weeks presented different challenges. Everyone has to learn about road rules, repairs, and maintenance. I learned how to change the brakes and take the tire off. I am very proud. I'm amazed um, about the program. Mom says some of that teaching rubbed off on her too. What's better is what happens next. We're actually going to ride as a family. So I started and I wanted my kids to learn how to ride a bike as well. Keep paddling, keep paddling. They learned the rules of the road and earned their wheels. I felt awesome. Are you lost? Are you lost? 
An introduction to cycling, which may help them travel better through life. For Carolina Impact, I'm Sharon Smith reporting. Thanks, Sharon. Trips for Kids enrolls children based on referrals from schools and community groups. The Recyclery says it's having its best year yet in terms of sales. You can help by donating a bike in good condition. Well, that's all we have time for tonight. We appreciate your time and look forward to seeing you back here again next time. Good night, my friends. of PBS Charlotte.